Your relationship with money matters. I'm Michelle Perkins, and this is the Money & You podcast, where I will be breaking down your relationship with money, offering tough love money tips, and a money dating plan that will focus on lifting the barriers to success to help pave the way for better money practices and increased wealth. It's time to take control to live a limit-free life. It starts today. Hello, hello, and welcome to The Money and You Show. I'm Michelle Perkins, your host, and I'm super excited today about our guest. We are going to talk about so many things today, elevating your life, keeping balance, how to incorporate money into that whole mix, and building a coaching business. So stick around. You're going to love the show. I'm going to tell you a little about our guest. His name is Michael Cohan. He is an ICF certified life coach who wakes up each morning with a simple purpose to help others rediscover their powerful inner strengths and give clients and students the tools they need to make more meaningful decisions, to aim higher, and to elevate their life. In 2015, he founded the Ele Elevate Life Project, an online community for people to rediscover their true selves and gain the skills they need to move forward and find lasting success. He's the host of the Elevate Life Project podcast, a show dedicated to helping listeners develop a positive mindset, a rejuvenated outlook for themselves and their future, rediscovering that they are spiritual beings and any dream a person wants in life is possible. Michael is dedicated to helping his clients and students find balance in all aspects of their lives, emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical well-being. He feels his purpose is to serve others through his teaching by encouraging students and clients to become steadfast in their practices while integrating spiritual and mindful living into their day-to-day -day lives to achieve their goals, live their dreams, and achieve the impossible. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you here. And I love all of that. And with all of that amazingness that you're helping people to experience in their life, I want to just kind of weave in the money aspect and see if we can get some of that uh, uh, understood by people as well, because obviously money is a part of our lives, whether we like it or not, the world we live in, that's the way it goes. And so I want to make people's money relationship also a rather spiritual one and one that is less stressful and less chaotic and, and less, uh, less scary. So, um, I'd love for you to start just by telling people about who you are, a little about your background, because it's super interesting. You didn't start here with what you're doing now. No. <laughs> <laughs> so my background, I guess I can start like typically born and raised, you know, Northeast New Jersey country boy growing up playing in the woods, you know, typical high school sports, very typical 90s growing up. And then I went off to college. I went to Penn State and then was at Rutgers. I was getting a degree in psychology and then going to get my master's in psychology with the idea of becoming a therapist. But this was 2001. Some tragedy happened on in September of that year. And I lost a few friends and some neighbors. And I sort of kind of dropped out of graduate school. I didn't really feel the purpose behind it. I didn't really know what to do with my life. I wanted to go on a spiritual journey. I wanted to move up to Vermont, but my parents convinced me to get a job. So I ended up finding myself by 2003, living in New York City, working for various real estate investment trusts, which is a uh, branch of Wall Street. I wasn't the smartest person in the room. I was the hardest working person in the room. Mm -hmm. If someone worked 10 hours a day, I worked 12 hours a day. If someone worked 12 hours a day, I worked 15 hours a day. Someone worked on a Saturday, I worked Saturday and Sunday. And through grit and hard work, I ended up finding myself at 30 years old with a graduate degree in finance from NYU in real estate. And I was making about $250,000 a year. But I felt so out of a line with who I am. The nature of New York City and the competitive nature of the work environment brought out the worst characters qualities in me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like that person looking back at me. And I just went on this journey. I started studying Judaism and went into Kabbalah. I studied Christian mysticism. 
I ended up practicing yoga at a time when yoga was still not everywhere. And yoga teachers were more than just fitness instructors. And I got to study along some great spiritual masters during this period. And that led me to question the life I was living. So around 2011, I quit my corporate job, which in hindsight probably was a mistake. And if I had to do it over again, we can talk about it later. I would have done it a little differently. Okay. And I decided to become a yoga teacher. And I went from making $250,000 a year to making $3,000 a month and really struggled financially for years as a yoga teacher. I realized along that journey, what I liked about teaching yoga wasn't actually teaching yoga. It was helping people. So I had this aha moment that I had this master's in psychology. So why don't I take this master's in psychology and use it somehow to apply that, that knowledge to help people. So I ended up becoming a life coach and going through certifications. And that's all I do today. That's the journey. That's an amazing journey. And uh, I think, yeah, a lot of, a lot of interesting questions. Uh, we do have a lot of people who listen, who are either in a career change, wanting a career change. And so you made a pretty dramatic one. Um, yeah. I, I would imagine there was some interesting feedback from the people around you, maybe even your parents or family members, and maybe not. Um, was was there any, you know, pushback on this decision? Was was it a conscious decision? Was it a reactive decision? How did you kind of go through the process of making that shift? It was a very conscious decision. I was 32 years old at the time, and on paper, I looked like I had it all. I lived in New York City. I had a brownstone apartment overlooking the park. I had a job. I was making all this money, weekends in the Hamptons, vacations in Cabo. Everything looked like on paper I was great. But behind closed doors, and no one knew this about me, I was, this was before there was the crackdown on Oxycontin. I had four prescriptions from four different doctors from Adderall, Focalin, and Ritalin. I had four different doctors giving me prescriptions to Vicodin, Percocet, Valium and Xanax. And I pretty much basically function on this like hyper intensive work environment, working 15, 18 hours a day through drugs, through performance medication, medication. And I weighed 230 pounds and I was just this miserable person. And one day a friend of mine said to me, you have to make a choice because if you keep down this road, you're going to die. And I really, that really shook me to the core. And I started seeing a therapist. And one day I realized that the problem wasn't me, it was my environment. And so I just chose my life over my money, my work, and I quit my job. I got a lot of pushback from my family. Uh, everyone thought I was throwing my life away because no one really understood the inner pain I was going through. And I was very judged for many years to the point where a lot of the people I had relationships with, I stopped talking to them because they kept telling me I was being a failure. Mm. I knew that I would eventually find my way back to where I would be successful, but I would find my way to being successful on terms that were more positive for me and a better environment. Mm -hmm. But I got judged by my parents my sister, my friends, no one really understood what I was doing. Plus, I also went on the deep end spiritually. I got to a point where I shaved my head and I was wearing robes and I took initiation vows and had a new name at one point in my life as a, you know, Hare Krishna monk that people really did not understand that part of me also. And it took a long time for me to find that balance between work to earn a living and to find that spiritual harmony of having purpose in life at the same time. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That is a really interesting story. And, you know, you stuck it out. I mean, you didn't sort of fall, you know, because of the pressure of other people or anything. You, you stayed on the journey. So it must have been a necessary one, I would imagine. And you must have been intuitively driven to keep going i think you must have known at some point that you were on the right path even though you didn't know how it was necessarily all going to turn out financially or any other way um i knew i wasn't happy mm -hmm. and i was there was a point where i was working all these crazy hours 
And I went to a workshop with a teacher. Her name was Sharon Gannon. And she was talking about spirituality and, and balance in life. And at the end of the lecture, there was a Q&A. And the person sitting next to me raised her hand and asked Sharon this question. And the person asked the question of, you seem to be happy in life and you seem to be very successful in life financially. And what's your secret? And Sharon responded back, I understand your question. And this answer resonated with me. And I've been carrying this with me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And she basically said, you're not happy right now, which is why you're asking me this question. You're trying to find happiness. But the idea of putting in the effort to change is also something that you wouldn't be happy with. So you don't make changes in your life because both the experience of change is unpleasant and the experience that you're having right now is unpleasant, but you're staying where you're at because that's the unpleasant that you know. Mm -hmm. But if you work hard and you go through that change, that growth, you will end up in a place that you will find fulfillment but you're not taking those steps because you don't know what that is. And you're looking for that certainty mm -hmm. and that doesn't exist in life. And you won't know what it is until you start making those changes. So if you're not happy now, and if you change, you won't be happy. You might as well do something instead because you're still going to be miserable. So what's the difference? Mm -hmm. And that changed my attitude and my outlook and it resonated with me because I was like, yes, that's how I feel. So let me go on this journey and I'm going to be miserable for years. And I was, I was lonely. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have any money. I was stuck in a basement apartment in the middle of nowhere, living off of $3,000 a month in New Jersey. So if you live in the Midwest, that's like $1,500 a month, mm -hmm. right? It's not a lot of money. And I basically had peanut butter and jelly for or breakfast, peanut butter and jelly for lunch and cereal for dinner for about a year before I started to really be able to support myself again. But I knew eventually I would get to a place where I am now. I just didn't know what that would be. Right. And that's the journey that we all have to go on. It's the change that's unpleasant that we have to have the courage to push through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, super interesting. And for a lot of people, um, the the shift in your, you know, your earnings, your your money situation, would have prevented them potentially from doing this. Tell me a little, you said earlier that you would have made a different decision or you would have done it a little differently, not made a different decision, but done it differently, um, maybe in hindsight. What what are you referring to? I know it was a money issue, but. Well, I was 32 years old and I was, you know, on this like quest of trying to figure out my life. And I definitely got trapped into the self-help toxicity of life, right? That toxic self-help. That if you're not living your best life and if you're not happy all the time, something's wrong. So you might as well quit your job, jump all in, and that's the only way to be successful. And that was the worst advice I ever took. Mm -hmm. Because if I just found a different job that was less intense, I would have been able to support myself financially. So I would have more money to invest in my coaching business, my yoga business. So my business would have grown exponentially faster. So instead of quitting, I could have pivoted. And no one ever told me that in those early days. I didn't hear that concept of pivot until later when I was teaching yoga and I was struggling. I was making like $5,000 a month, which is a good living as a yoga teacher, but I wasn't thriving. And instead of quitting my job and just doing coaching, I instead kept teaching yoga and pivoted to life coaching. And that's what made it easier the second time. Hmm. The biggest mistake is you have to have money to build something. If you don't have an income coming in, you're not going to be able to grow because it takes an investment. It takes you have to. It takes money to learn how to do your business. It takes hmm. money to get clients. It takes money to to market. It takes money for your web services and your hosting and all the software you have to run your business. It's not cheap. This this mic that I have isn't you know it's expensive. It's not a cheap mic, but we need these tools in order to thrive. And we get that through money because money is an exchange of energy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, you were making a great living before that. You could have mm. ideally, I guess, had some savings and things like that. But one, not you, but people in general get caught up in the lifestyle and are, are easily spending everything they're making. So 
was that the situation with you? Did you have money to kind of fall back on? When I quit my job, I I had about a hundred and fifty thousand dollars put aside. Okay. I burnt it in a year. Okay. Because I had no idea how to live in a different lifestyle. I went from making two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year plus biannual bonuses. So mm-hmm. that's almost a half a million dollars a year at 32 years old to having no income and being fed through podcasts and all these YouTube memes of just keep going and it's going to work out and just hustle, 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 and you'll make it. So I had this idea that I was going to succeed within a year, no matter what. And I didn't have this idea in my head that it would take me almost a decade to get to the point where I'm at now, where I have a thriving coaching business that I'm making six figures again, and I have a savings I didn't realize how long it would take. And t- so many times we get sold this idea that it's going to be really simple for you to be a successful life coach. It's going to be really simple. Just quit your job and you'll have clients. And that's mm-hmm. just isn't reality. Yes. And um, a couple of things on that. I had a similar experience um, where we sold a business, but we, you know, we, we just we're confident that we would figure it out. And so we had a lot of money in the bank and we were just sort of living on it while we figured things out, didn't really have a plan. And, and we had responsibility. We were all older. We were like 50. And so um, we had kids, we had all kinds of things going on, private schools and you name it. And I, I really resonated with what you said, because there wasn't any aspect of our lifestyle that we changed while we were just using savings <laughs> and right. um and we also thought that the whole thing was going to materialize much more quickly the next chapter than it did and um so yeah i i look back on that as a huge lesson you do burn through money very quickly when you're not very quickly and i would say you know if you think you can go a year assume you can go four months instead it's just it it goes so much faster and then you would think, and you do have to kind of recognize that, you know, the lifestyle does actually have to change while you're in that mode. Um, but you're so, like you say, you're so anticipating what's to come. It's all going to be great and it's going to be huge. And, you know, you you sort of, your mindset goes to a very positive place, which I like. I, you know, I like, I think it's important to have a positive outlook. But at the same time, when it comes to money, um, there is you know, it's a fine line. You you have to get real and try to avoid falling into fear. So it's a, it's an interesting space to kind of uh, be in with money, but. Yeah. I mean, so like one of the things that I've realized over the years of coaching with clients with money, I have clients that make millions of dollars and I have clients that make $70,000 a year. I am always shocked how little most of my clients have put aside. Shocked. Even with my clients that make hundreds and hundreds and thousands of dollars an hour and have bringing in millions of dollars, still don't have a lot of money saved because they don't have a positive relationship with money. Mm-hmm. And they don't understand that having a savings and having that idea of putting money aside each month, month and never touching it is an idea of a habit. Like everything that we do in life is a habit. We're not conscious. We all, we're not conscious people. We're happy people. So if we don't have the habit of saving 20% of our income when we're struggling, mm-hmm. we're not going to save money when we're flush and making tons of money. This mm-hmm. like, if we don't have the habit of donating money to charity when we're struggling, we're not going to have the habit of donating money when we're flush. We have to understand that everything that we do is a habit. And the habit that every person should have is to be saving a minimum of 10, 10% of your income and the maximum of 30%, no matter what. Even if you're struggling, you should always be saving something because there's going to be months throughout the year where you're not going to be able to save because you have a car payment or you have to buy a new car. I just went through it. My car got a, it's an emoji. I, the check engine light came on. I have 250,000 miles. I've been pushing to purchase a new car for months because of everything that's going on with interest rates and inventory. And this car should have been replaced years ago because of COVID. I kept delaying it, delaying it, needed new brakes, new tires, and then the check engine late. So I was like, gotta buy a new car. 
So I had to take out $10,000 out of our emergency fund to buy the new car. Mm -hmm. Now, most people just keep living. They don't sit there and say, oh, now I got to save twice as much money for the next four months to pay back that emergency fund while I continue to save. Because most wealthy millionaires, unless they were given it to them and they were born with it, they're not wealthy because they earned a lot of money. They're wealthy because they saved a lot of money. Yeah. 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 It's a really interesting thing because people keep chasing the earnings, which is, you know, I get that. And that can be a good thing. But it really is what my grandfather used to say. It's not what you earn. It's what you keep. And, you know, that was not well understood until later. But you know, I can still hear him saying it. And it's it's so true. So let's get back to. Uh, I want to talk more about this because I, I love your take on it. And I also love the fact that you're working with clients. I mean, how much of the conversation that you have with clients does at some point revolve around money or or does it? Maybe it does. All the time. All the time. I'm constantly and I'm not even I, I'm a life coach. And I will say I will spend four sessions on trying to teach clients on a bare minimum of how to track their expenses through a spreadsheet or using online programs like Simplify or uh, Every Dollar where they just track all their expenses. And it will take me six months to get a client to actually do the homework of writing down all their expenses because they rather keep their heads in the sand and ignore their financial woes. Because spending money is fun. <laughs> Getting out of debt is no fun. It's March. I bought this car in January, February. I have to basically pay back this like down payment that I put down for the next four months. That means I'm not like going doing fun things. I'm doing a little fun things, but I have to be <laughs> mindful. Yeah. Yeah. One of the adv best advices I ever got was about eight years ago when I was teaching yoga full time. And I live in Somerset County, New Jersey, which is one of the most expensive counties in the country. And I'm not one of these people, but where I live right down the road from me is a town called Far Hills, New Jersey, where it is one of the this huge town with only 900 homes. The average home is on 40 acres of land, about 45 minutes outside of New York City, it's all estate money, large wealth, hedge fund managers, Rockefellers, old money. And I would go to this one guy's house to do a private for him three days a week. And he would try to give me a hundred dollars three days a week. And one of these days I asked him, I was like, cause I became good friends with him. I was like, how do you have all this money? Where did it come from? And he said, I didn't work hard to acquire goods. He says, I work hard to acquire assets. Hmm. Most people work to acquire goods that they don't need. Mm -hmm. He's like, you only get those luxury goods when it no longer affects your ability to acquire assets and the assets provide you with the luxury goods. Wow. It's pretty changed cool. my life. Yeah. Yeah. That is really good advice. Um, interesting. I love that. So, okay. You're, you're building a life coaching business. And I talk to a lot of people who are looking at that as an option. And as you know, um, there's a great deal of promotion, propaganda, whatever you want to call it out there, encouraging people to go into every kind of coaching. And, um, and it's a, it's a, it's an absolutely wonderful service to provide to the world. I love coaching. I have coaches. I am a coach. I, I love the coaching field. And I too thought about being a therapist um, way back in the day. And when I look at it now, every now and then I sort of think, hmm, should I go back and you know look at that again? But then you wouldn't be able to coach. And I personally feel like coaching is uh, more powerful actually in, in many ways. Although I've had a ton of therapy. I love therapists too, um, but it's different. And so, I mean, Completely different. as a person who had thought about becoming a therapist and I do talk to I talk to therapists who want to become coaches. I talk to coaches who are debating about therapy. I mean, how would you, this is kind of an odd question, but it just occurred to me. I mean, how did, how did you think about it? And how would you uh, 
So one of the reasons why I never ended up becoming a licensed therapist and the reason why I dropped out of graduate school is during the period when I was doing my clinical studies where you have to basically do mock uh, therapy and then you have to volunteer, you have to do a certain amount of hours at a clinic. I hated it. Mm. I hated it. Okay. I hated because as a therapist, you, you're not allowed to basically be like, what the heck? And shake the person and be like, don't you see the truth? And this is like what you, you're not allowed to do that. You have to give inference. You're allowed to, your, your, your job is to help people process. Your job is to help people cope through. Your job is not to give people advice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A therapist can be a life coach, but a life coach can never be a therapist. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are thinking about coming a life coach, it is a booming industry. It is not going anywhere. There is a need in the United States for life coaches because there is a mental health crisis. Most of the people I know that um, they come to a coach is because they're like, yeah, I was trying to see a therapist and they were charging me $500 an hour and I had to wait six months to see them. And I just need somebody to help me out with just making some better choices in life. So there is a need for life coaching and it's not going away. Right. But here's the thing for those of you who are thinking about coming a life coach. It is not being an influencer on Instagram and it's not being a motivational speaker. Coaching is work. I love it. It is work. You are meeting with people one hour every week or every other week. And that's how you earn your living. If you're not coaching, you're not making money. So don't think, oh, I'm going to have 10 clients and my clients are going to give me $500 an hour, and I'm going to be this massively successful person and spend the rest of my time on the beach. That is not reality. That is someone trying to sell you something that is not real, and you're just giving them your money. Any coach I know that's good works really hard, sees around 40 to 50 clients a month. And yes, eventually, when you've been doing coaching for 5, 10, 15 years, when you have a, a client base, and you have a following, you can begin to sell courses that will free up some of your time. And that's not going to happen for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know, you know, as you do, people are hearing something different, but a lot of the people that we hear the most from are not actually doing coaching. They're digital right. marketers. They're, uh, you know, they're running businesses that may have coaches uh, available and, and maybe employed by them. But um, yeah, it is a, it's a really interesting world once you get into the business side of it. And so like anything, you know, um, there is the, uh, the side of it that is the, the actual work that one wants to provide. And then there's a business that you also have to run. And, and I think for anybody, for lawyers, doctors, dentists, whoever, um, they kind of forget that piece. Like I have a business to run and I just want to, I just want to see patients all day, but um, there is this business aspect of it, uh, and, and I think people need to learn that aspect of it, too. Uh, yeah, I mean, I typically start my day coaching at like 830 in the morning, and I'll typically see between five and six people a day, and I'll usually end my day at 730 at night. And in between those days, I'm sending out content and emails to clients and doing marketing and jumping on podcasts or doing a motivational video all to just help raise my brand that mm -hmm. requires me to put in, you know, 60, 70 hours a week to run a successful thriving coaching business. My struggle with people when they tell me they want to be a life coach is most people come to it because they're not happy in their current job for sure, or they're at a crossroad and they want to do something else with their lives, right. but they don't realize it's the work that they need to do and the time it's going to take for them to build a successful coaching business. Mm -hmm. And you have to be good at marketing. You have to be good at sales. You have to be good with technology. All these things you have to be pretty proficient at in order to have a thriving online business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you have to have enough resources to hire a lot of that out. I mean, and, and know what you're doing enough to be able to manage that process as well. But um, yeah, it's super interesting. And I, I, Okay. So, you know, we talked a little about elevating your life with a sense of balance. You are working a lot of hours. So how do you get the, you know, how do you attain some level of balance? So I have work-life balance because I work really hard. 
And because I work really hard, I make a good living. Because I get, make a good living, I live 10 minutes from lifetime. So I get to go to a really high-end gym. So I go there every morning. Mm -hmm. And because I work really hard, I get to work from home every day. I don't have a commute. So I don't have to go anywhere. So I don't have the hour and a half commute that most people have that is coming back for most people. And every afternoon, I get to take an hour lunch break with a half hour nap. And mm -hmm. every every evening for dinner, as I'm working, I get to eat a home-cooked meal. And then because I work really hard, I'm able to enjoy my life on the weekends by going places and enjoying nice restaurants and going to plays and, and theater and sporting events. Too many people today, and yes, we do need to find a little bit of a correction in America, but there's too much of this idea of bare minimum Mondays and quiet quitting. And if you're in that mindset, here's the thing. AI is coming for your job. Outsourcing is coming for white office jobs. And if you are doing bare minimum Mondays and you're doing quiet quitting, you're not going to have a job in the next five years because somebody else is going to do your job for you, whether it's a computer or a person overseas. So we need to, we need to find balance where we're not overworked, but we also have to understand that that's part of life is to work hard because if we work hard, then we acquire money. If we acquire money and we invest it in, into assets, then we make a better life for ourselves. But the problem is everybody works to acquire things. Mm -hmm. you, that's, not, that's where you don't have work-life balance because then everybody has debt and everybody has stress and anxiety. It's when you're walking around because you have $30,000 in the bank and you have, you're on track to retire wealthy that that's when you begin to acquire that balance that everyone wants. But it doesn't come cheap and it doesn't come for free. It's interesting when you talk about that, it's almost like is, is the question really balance or is it being able to live with less of a sense of stress um, because you're still working hard. And I do like to make the point that, you know, there's this old paradigm of, you know, working hard equates to more money and that doesn't that isn't always the case you have to work hard but you have to work smart you have to have a good work i like to think of it as having it's important to have a good work ethic but not necessarily to grind yourself into the ground that doesn't always you know in your case you're finding that there's that's a path to making more money for some people they work incredibly hard they have three jobs and you know they're all low paying but they're killing them i mean they are working hard but they're not going to necessarily get wealthy they're gonna you know be able to well there's a statistic that i read that the average self-made millionaire in america makes less than a hundred thousand dollars a year mm, interesting okay so two people like the average self-made millionaire like two married couple makes less than a hundred thousand dollars a year Right. I, when I was when I was starting out with this coaching business, I lived my wife and I lived in a very small, affordable housing complex that wasn't really nice. That was kind of in like the like the, the hood. And we worked really hard to build our her non for profit and my coaching business. Mm -hmm. And we drove old cars. And because we drove old cars while we were working this coaching business, we were able to save money to buy the condo that we live in now. And I looked around the whole time I was there and everybody was driving a luxury car, but us. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at all my friends and a lot, and it's hard to buy a house these days. Mm -hmm. And I looked at a lot of my friends that are, you know, were struggling to buy a house and they all were driving luxury cars, going on luxury vacations, wearing designer clothes, mm -hmm. but yet they seem to not be able to buy a house and be able to afford the house that they're living in. Work-life balance is about living beneath your financial means, mm -hmm. putting aside a percentage of your income to acquire more assets, and then and living modestly and not trying to constantly chase things. That So, like, so that eventually... When you get to a point in your life, you can get to the place where you're you're working five, five and a, five, four and a half hours, or excuse me, five or four and a half days a week, and you're working nine to five. Like my vision is in the next 10 years, I want to be working a four-day work week. I want to be making about $350,000 a year working those four days. I'm working really hard to get there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's that's great. I, I think that's a great explanation. Um, and so, okay, so let's hear a little more about you know your relationship with money, how how it's changed. I mean, you've explained enough so that I'm, I'm kind of getting a picture. But obviously, you're telling other people not to avoid it, to make sure they know what they're spending. I mean, what kind of practices have you put in place for your business and maybe for your personal life that, that help you with that? Well, let's just go spiritual since there's a little Buddha standing behind you. Mm -hmm. uh, so money is spirituality, right? If you look at and look at the Hindu pantheon and the Buddhist pantheon, money is a goddess energy, all right? In Sanskrit, money is called Lakshmi. It's the goddess of, of money, and it's the you know partner of Vishnu, who is the maintainer of the universe. And so money is given to you through hard work for you to maintain your life. If we look at money as a gift given to us, then we understand that it's that then we value money. This is why my wife and I are very mindful. Like we don't throw pennies on the ground. Like, because if you throw pennies on the ground and you discard, oh, it's just a penny, then you're not taking money seriously. And so when you look at money as an exchange of energy, then that relationship is creates a spiritual connection that the money you have is a gift given to you. So then you have to ask yourself the question of like, what do I do with that money to make my life better? and the world around me better. And when we shift to that mindset, then we shift away from, oh, I get this money to go buy the things I don't need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was really well said. Thank you. I um, I think shifting your perspective, and you talk a lot about uh, mindset with your, with your clients. So that's a beautiful mindset for money. I like to think of it as your partner, as you go through life, as an ally for you and your business and to treat it that way. I mean, the whole idea behind having a relationship is, you know, how do you, how do you treat your relationships? How do you interact in relationships? You can do the same with money. You can pay attention to it. You can care about it. You can get to know it. I mean, these things are all sort of basic. Uh, we don't even think about them in regular relationships, but for some reason with our money, we, we treat it entirely differently. Um, it's this weird tab but taboo where you know people are told not to people are saying people are told never to talk about money because it's considered rude. And right. I'm always like, know your numbers, know your money, and be comfortable with talking about it. Mm -hmm. That you have to learn to be comfortable with the concept of money because if you don't, then you're never going to have any money. You have to know where your money is going. And what you're doing with that money, or it's always going to be gone. And whenever I get money, I always say thank you. Like whenever I get paid by a client and that money shows up in my bank account, I am always like, thank you for the money. I appreciate it. And when money leaves me, I always say thank you for your services. Mm. I know my money to a T. Every day I log into my accounts and I track everything I spend. So I know my habits. Most people, they just, they have credit cards. They have a salary and they just slowly acquire credit card debt. And the next thing they know, they have $20,000 in consumer debt. That is the dumbest thing to ever have. There's no reason ever to have consumer debt. Yeah, it's that's a tough one. Because, um, you know, people, I agree, it's the worst kind of debt and you should try to avoid it. There are times when we have to have it. So, you know. Car loan, hospital bills, jobs, a mortgage. Going on. Mm hmm and so, but again, what people even do with that is because there is a lot of shame around it. And there is this, you know, kind of, a, you, you know, you're creating something that's going to be a problem for you. So you still run away from it, even though it's the, the thing that you should be putting as a priority to actually figure out and, you know, to take some action on. Money is like a marriage or a relationship. You have to constantly work at it or it's not going to work for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. That's, I couldn't agree more. Let's talk for a minute about um, you brought up ha brought up how you know habits are so important. Um, let's talk about habits and goals and how you kind of work those into your your business, which is sure. really you know, given a lot of thought to. So whenever I start with a new client, I always go through sort of the same sort of couple steps in the beginning to establish a baseline for people. The first thing that we do 
is we take a life assessment quiz called the Wheel of Life, where we have them rate their lives on a scale of one to 10 in nine key areas. And then every three months after that, we retake the quiz to see how they're doing in life. After that, we do a visioning exercise where we envision them as an old person and they are reflecting on an ideal life so we can see if they have the ability to have goals. About half the people that do that are unable to complete the exercise because they have no idea of how to have a life vision. They're just on autopilot. So then we have to go through and they start a goal setting journal to give them the, start developing the goal strength to be able to have goals and set goals. Mm -hmm. If they do the rocking chair well, the next thing that we do is first we do is what we establish is people's habits because what we do in the morning and throughout the week allow is going to determine our ability to achieve our goals. So if a client has the goal of losing 20 pounds, but doesn't have the habit of exercising, there's no way they're going to lose 20 pounds. So we have to establish a series of simple baseline habits. And what we do is we start with, off with simple successes like drinking two glasses of water in the morning, taking a vitamin every day, going for a 15 minute walk, reading before bed, turning off social media. And we start to track those habits so that then we can begin to compound on them to begin to establish hard, excuse me, harder habits for them to be able to achieve their goals. Once we've established the baseline habits, we move into goal setting where we have them first pick their word for the year. The reason why we pick a word for the year is it's easier to have a word that represents what you want to accomplish versus trying to set in a bunch of New Year's resolutions, which most people fail at. So like, for example, my word for the year this year is to prosper. And it basically for me defined it as to be financially successful, flourish physically, grow strong and healthy, and to strengthen and deepen my marriage and my relationship with my friends. So my theme for the year is those three things. After we have that theme, then we can begin to establish the goals around it and understand what we want to do each month. And then we go back to the habit tracker and we reevaluate the habits that they need to do in order to achieve those monthly goals. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. So, and what about mindset? How do, how do you help people to kind of adjust their mindset? So it aligns with all of this. Mindset is the hardest thing for people to, to fix because we have between 70 and 90,000 thoughts a day. And I'm sure in the next five years, there's going to be a study that we have even more. <laughs> Change it every year. It keeps getting higher and higher. Most of those thoughts are on a subconscious level, right? Even in this conversation that we're having, people listening to this podcast, they might listen to and retain five minutes of this entire conversation. Because most of it's happening on a subconscious level. So a lot of all our all our thinking is done below the surface. And a lot of that focuses on our flaws and our, our limiting beliefs and our negative attitude towards ourselves. So if I need to help a client change their mindset, and since we're on the money podcast, I have to help them change their mindset around money. The only way for me to do it is for them to begin to develop a meditation practice because meditation allows us to bring to the surface our subconscious thoughts so we can begin to examine our mindset and then begin to keep a journal in relationship to a particular topic that we're trying to change. So, And that's the only tool, two tools I've ever found that work. Because once I can understand the Sam scars or the thought patterns that are going through this beneath the surface, then we can begin to reprogram them through repetitive behavioral psychology. Mm -hmm. That's repeating like a, a, a mission statement or a contract that then through that we apply action. So if I have a client who has a bad relationship with money, they have I have them keep a journal. It's a it's a money journal where they keep they you know write it's a writing exercise where they meditate they journal 
then we begin to we review it and we figure out the limiting beliefs then through that we then create a uh, a reprogramming tool that they begin to repeat three times a day and then then we create habits around that reprogramming tool mm -hmm, mm -hmm. love that love that so much i i totally agree with that methodology and when you um when you say we have them repeat it a few times a day that is doing what to their brains basically it's re so it's called repetitive behavioral psychology it's a technique that it's been around since the 70s it gets made fun of a lot through affirmations and mantras because if someone sits there and says and repeats the affirmation three times a day i'm going to be a millionaire i'm going to be a millionaire but doesn't do anything about it it's useless it works as long as the person who is repeating the affirmation is used to help reprogram a particular thought first. And then it also has to be applied through action and habits. So you can't just create the affirmation without coming up with the discipline and the rules around it. Right. Right. But they, it, I, again, totally agree. And, um, but you also taking the actions alone won't necessarily uh, allow it to, to stick or to correct manifest or whatever word you want to use here. But um, yeah, so they go together so beautifully. And even if they feel weird, um, you know, and, and I know it, with money, people tend to jump to something like that's never going to work. I just need to, I need to make more. Or there's always like the easy, like answer, even though it's not easy because they don't know how to make more, but it's always like a place to go. That's hard to, you know, really do in the moment. So I get this all the time with clients. I get this kind of, I have, it's, I get this, it's a reoccurring theme. It's like, they'll be like, every time I try to save that emergency fund, something comes up and I have to start all over again. Every time I start to tackle my credit card debt, something comes up and I have to start all over again. And you can understand this in relationship. And I know this might like upset a couple of your clients, but it's in relationship to karma. Okay. Karma is a word. And let's understand that karma is, you know, cause and effect. Mm -hmm. So if you have for 10 years been not good with your money and you're in debt and you have no emergency fund and then you come along and you start working with a financial coach or a life coach or start developing the habits and you're no longer spent overspending well you've been putting energy into that that habit for 10 years think of it like a ceiling fan when you put the energy in it starts off to rotate really slow and the more energy you put in, it turn, gets faster and faster and faster and faster. And eventually you stop putting energy into it and you turn off the fan. But does the fan stop its rotation? Continues to rotate. And the longer you put energy into it, the longer that fan's going to rotate until you begin to shift into a different life. So that's why a lot of times when you're working with people who are struggling with trying to make these changes with good money habits, and they keep being like, every time I go in six months, I got this happen. So I got to start all over again. They don't realize that that's just because for 10 years they were doing something else that eventually that fan will stop and they won't continue to have to start over again because they're slowly making headway. They think it's going to be like six months, one and done, instead of like six years of constantly restarting and restarting till they finally get to a point where they've paid off their debt, they have their emergency fund, and then they're able to start acquiring equity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that money relationship, just like you said, is like any other important relationship. It, it's not going to have some point that you reach where we are we are done we're you know we've done everything we need to do it's just not going to happen it's a lifetime um relationship and it's one that will require you to keep this mindset and the actions and habits going for a lifetime they're going to change they're going to be different um but uh yeah it's uh and some of it will be a little more on autopilot it'll take less effort for sure but yeah. um 
but yeah, it, it is important to look at that and it is important to, um, you know, that's creating a self-limiting belief as well to say, well, you know, every time uh, it, looks- it happens for like a year, like literally the first year, that's all I hear constantly is yeah. every time I start to put money aside, this other thing comes up and we have to constantly, I'm like, well, what are your habits? I'm like, you have this vacation that you didn't need to go, that you scheduled that you don't go on in the dark, but my wife or my husband wants to do it, or they have this expense for the kids camp. Well, they don't need to go to camp that summer. So you have to begin to slowly shift the behavior and the habits in relationship to money. And it takes them a long time to see that. Right. Right. And if you aren't clear on your goals, none of it makes sense anyway, because then it's like, why not go to camp? And how is that even going to impact anything? And maybe camp is important because it is part of what you have for a goal in your life. So, you know, you really have to be very specific um, about what success is to you, how much money is really what you want. People will say, oh, I, you know, I want a lot of money. I want to be rich. That doesn't mean anything. I mean, you have to actually quantify that because a lot of times what I've found is you don't actually need as much money as you think you do Correct. to live the life that you want as you, you know, it might be somebody else's life that requires a lot more money, but sometimes everything you really want um, is within a man- manageable kind of range. So it's just too much social media. It's too much <laughs> crap. I mean, sorry if I'm like, it's just like everybody's is this. I mean, I'm amazed how many people sit on their phones all day just scrolling through and all they see is highlight reels of other people living better lives than you and somehow if you're not doing that there's something wrong with you so you're constantly trying to chase the highlight reels of everybody else's lives and we have to learn to be grateful for and find joy in the day-to-day routine of our lives Mm -hmm. yeah and that's where the mindfulness piece comes in right is that yeah Well, all mindfulness is really an understanding that our thoughts and emotions affect our environment and our environment affects our thoughts and emotions. So if you have a messy home, you're going to have a messy mind. If you have a clean, orderly home, you're going to have a clean, orderly mind. If you're out of balance, if you're not good with your money and you're all over your, you're, you're all over the place with your finances, then you're going to be all over with your life. That's all mindfulness is. Mm -hmm. So interesting. We we are running out of time here. I'd love for you to tell people how to get in touch with you, how to learn more from you. Um, why don't you go ahead and let people know? Yeah. If you just go to my website, elevatelifeproject.com, everything's there for you. From my blog, vlog, my little mini podcast where I spend like five minutes twice a week giving people actionable advice to a quiz on finding your life purpose is all there. Right. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. You are a wealth of wisdom and knowledge, and and I love the way you articulated everything. A lot of really valuable uh, information. And and you're right, people take about five minutes away. I hope they go back and re-listen because there's a lot more in there. And uh, my takeaway is uh, your advice about uh, spending, (laughs) investing in assets before you spend. I think that was... um, Uh, Yeah, work to acquire equity. Like that's like you work to acquire equity, whether it's in stocks and bonds or real estate. And the thing that this one person told me as advice, he says, you buy and never sell. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. I've gotten pretty old and I've now and my I've heard this several times and uh, I wish I'd I wish I'd heard it a lot earlier uh, because that never selling, you know, you don't. You, you don't get that one as much thought. So if you... If Everybody you're... chases the market always. They're like, oh my God, buy, sell, buy, sell. I'm always like, just buy and hold. It's going to come back. <laughs> yep. I'm yep. not even a stock guru. I just put it in a robo account, but you just buy and buy and buy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. So thank you so much for being here today. And uh, a lot of a lot of really wonderful information and stories for people who may be going through a career transition, might be unhappy at work, might be trying to figure out their finances, might be trying to figure out whether they want to be a life coach. So um, yeah, I really appreciate it. And I hope people will uh, check out your website and audience. As you know, you can find me at michelle at limitfreelife.com. And I have some 
uh, some great information for you on the Limit Free Life website. We will be starting a next money date course, which is how my way of helping you to figure out uh, how to have a great relationship with your money by dating it. And so you can contact me about that. And if you have any questions about the podcast, you'd like to be on the podcast, Michelle2Ls at LimitFreeLife.com, reach out and let me know. So, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you, audience, for being here. You can find us on all the podcast platforms. You can find us on Roku and the Limit Free Life YouTube channel. And the show will be broadcast Mondays at 7 o'clock. And after that, show up all over the place. So thank you so much for being here. We love when you listen to the show. And if you'd like to leave a review or give us a like, that is much appreciated. We'll see you next week.